Building performance is a growing industry nationwide. The rising cost of energy, increased interest in indoor air quality, ongoing demand for better comfort, and timeless concern for building durability require that we focus on building science more than ever. I'm Tony Oliver, Building Performance Manager at Lands Heating and Cooling. I'm a home energy rater, certified building analyst, and your host for today's program. If you'd like to join us in our mission to help make America energy independent, the first step is understanding energy. Good day, my name is Tony Oliver. I'm the building scientist at Lands Heating and Cooling in Champaign, Illinois. And I am also a HERS rater, which means that I'm certified to place the Energy Star labels on new homes. And I'm also a Building Performance Institute certified building professional and building shell professional. And uh, it's my job to analyze buildings, find energy defects, and fix them. The purpose of our program today is to help you understand some basic energy defects in buildings. What we'll be looking at is mostly mostly new buildings just because it's easier to see the defects in new buildings but uh, those defects also exist in existing buildings. Just remember this material is based on the thermal bypass checklist guide from Energy Star version 2 which is no longer the most modern version of Energy Star but the checklist guide gives us some basic understanding of energy defects and that should be useful for most of the people watching this program. You should understand that the standards designed for Energy Star are not necessarily compliant with all local codes. So if there's anything in Energy Star that's different from your local codes, remember that local codes take precedence. To begin with, as advice for viewing this program, you'll see that there's some thermal images that we'll see on screen. Simply put, a thermal image does not look through walls to see what's on the other side. Instead, it looks at the surface temperature of the wall and gives us a visual readout of the surface temperature there. Now on our thermal image, the darker black and blue spots are the colder locations, the red, yellow, those are hotter and hotter locations. So as we can see from this thermal image, you have uh, a wall that adjoins an attic and uh, there's air leakage and heat leakage through that wall and we can see that with the thermal image. That's just a little advice for how to understand thermal images as we see them in the program. It's uh, this thermal bypass checklist guide is designed to help builders and uh, people who are doing renovations on their home to uh, coordinate with their various contractors to get the jobs done, the work done correctly. There will be many trades on the job and we need to be able to facilitate work so that one trade can can get something done correctly before they pass work on to the next trade, onto the next trade, and the next trade. We call that critical path and uh, general contractors should be familiar with the critical path. Also, the key of energy efficient design is design itself. Energy efficiency can't be an afterthought. Energy efficiency has to be planned and built into the entire process. So energy should be considered throughout the entire design. Architects need to understand the concepts in this program and they need to be able to draw details that will enable the people in the field to be able to uh, assemble the building as intended. We can't just leave it up to the imagination to, uh, to determine how things are to be done. Please be, please be considerate of your crew. If you have Spanish-speaking crew, make sure that drawings and written instructions are provided in Spanish. We can't just assume that Spanish-speaking people will be able to understand what we're asking them to do. Take the time, if you have a Spanish-speaking crew, to, to make those provisions. Also, the way that we have typically built buildings over the years that our carpenters and bricklayers and everyone else has gotten used to is not necessarily the way we should continue to build buildings in the future. So, Fine details, drawings, and specific. So, fine details, 
drawing and specification needs to be provided for the trades. Uh, details that uh, require special attention are all over the building. So any place that two types of construction join, any place that there's a, a valley, any place that uh, we switch one, from one floor to another, anytime there's a penetration from one area to another, there need to be details on how to handle that. Generally, all the trades need to understand that when they're penetrating the outside of the building, whether it's going up into the attic or out through a wall, they need to take as much care as possible to make the openings as small as possible, or we get assemblies which eventually, ultimately, will pass, but cost too much to seal up and are just a mess. If we can cut the right-sized hole to put a pipe or a wire through, instead of cutting a very big hole or using a hammer to knock out a hole, then we'll be much better off in the end. Remember that you need to be able to coordinate with your local code officials to make sure that the things that you're doing comply with codes, particularly fire code. Energy code often assists with the fire code. The fire code requires certain things that are beneficial to energy efficiency, but just make sure that you're working with your code officials. When you have a complicated detail, make sure that drawings are provided to show every piece of that detail to every trade that might be involved with that detail. Here we have an example of a drawing provided by the National Roofing Contractors Association, which shows how a certain detail is to be created. Many roofing contractors or roofing manufacturers will not provide a warranty unless the assembly is built according to uh, some specific assembly. You don't have to do a whole lot of extra work here. Most of the time you can find details that have already been created by the manufacturer, the NRCA, uh, any number of other professional engineering groups that can help you cut the work and uh, improve the quality. If you have any ideas on how to make work flow better or to uh, make work more affordable, better materials, better practices, certainly share that with the general contractor or the designer or the people who are in the field doing the work. Also, once the work is underway, it's important to continue to inspect the construction while it's being built. Remember that a builder justifies his existence by coordinating the work of many other people. The best way to create value in this world is to make a finished product out of many other products, a finished product that has more value than the sum of the value of its parts. That's what a general contractor does, that's what a developer does, and you should understand that that's your job to inspect the building as it's being built, coordinate all the trades together, don't expect them all to coordinate amongst themselves. Finally, you should institute practices and procedures that will allow you to be able to keep track and checklist the quality. Here's an example of the Energy Star Thermal Bypass Checklist. Again, materials like this are available to you. You don't have to do all the work of creating a new program. Those programs are there for you. It is also, you should understand, the goal of a building scientist like myself or any other building inspectors who come along. It's their goal to help the builder, help the developer, help the designer to create a better building. We're not here just to bust on people. We want people to truly understand energy and we want people to be able to build better buildings. Buildings play a very important role in our lives. They're, they have a huge impact on our health, on our comfort, and on our costs. So right into building defects, I'll explain that um, a lot of the heat that's lost in a building is not simply lost by conducting out through solid materials. First of all, heat is lost in three basic ways. Through conduction, where heat moves through a solid material to the exterior. Through convection, 
where heated air or let's say cooled air escapes the building envelope and finally through radiant heat loss. Most of what we're going to talk about in this program is conduction and convection. We're going to begin by talking about convection, the loss of heated air or air conditioned air or the introduction of outside air, often contaminated air, into the home. Most insulation does not stop the flow of air, especially fiberglass insulation. Fiberglass insulation actually can filter air as it comes into the house. Think of your home furnace filter, often made of fiberglass. It'll catch a little bit of trash, but generally let the air right through. You should understand that fiberglass insulation, the actual glass material itself, has some insulating properties, but the real insulating material in the fiberglass are the air bubbles that are trapped by the glass. And it's that, that air that has the resistance to the transfer of heat. If the wind can blow right through your fiberglass insulation, it'll wash those air bubbles right out of there, and virtually all the insulation value is lost from the material. Air permeable insulation, especially fiberglass insulation, needs to be encapsulated on all six sides, that is top, bottom, right, left, and front and back. In normal construction, let's say of a wall, you'll have wall studs right and left, a building plate at the bottom and a building plate at the top, in most cases, drywall on the inside, and sheathing on the outside of the building. This is not always the case. This is a step that gets skipped sometimes, especially in attic knee walls, and we'll talk about that uh, later on in the program. Ideally, the air barrier that surrounds the house should be contiguous and continuous. I should be able to take a pen and put it onto the blueprints of that house and draw an air barrier completely around and have that line connect with itself without ever taking that pen off of the paper. If there are breaks in the air barrier, then it's, it shows that we've, we've come to a basic misunderstanding of how to build. When we build, we need to figure out where the outside ends and where the inside begins. This sounds obvious, but this kind of reasoning is still missed in new construction today. When we have penetrations, pipe penetrations, duct penetrations, electrical shafts, and any number of other things that we'll be talking about here shortly, then we have gotten into a breakdown between where does outside end and where does inside begin. Shafts and other locations like this that are neither inside or outside are called interstitial zones. Also, when we have fiberglass insulation or really any insulation inside of a wall, we need to make sure that that insulation fills the space cover to cover completely and that there are no gaps or voids in the wall. If there are, are wooden backers or other objects inside of the wall that compress the insulation, that can create a little void in there that again squeezes out the air that is the real insulating material and allows a little convective loop to get set up in that little pocket of air so that air will run up against the hot side, carry that heat to the outside and deposit it, cool down and then continue in a loop taking energy right out of the house. Also if two bats of fiberglass or any other kind of insulation come up close to each other but don't touch, then there's a void right through the middle where heat can escape. Here's an example of compression in fiberglass insulation. This is a really common detail in new construction. Virtually all of the existing houses in town have some kind of detail like this where a pipe or a wire or some other obstruction has compressed the insulation. The insulation is not tight to the back of the drywall and whenever insulation doesn't touch the back of the air barrier and they're not fully aligned, then there's energy loss. That insulation needs to be right up against the, the drywall in the heated space. A pipe or a wire like this needs to be embedded in the insulation by slicing or pulling apart the insulation to create a relief 
that can then be folded back over. Simple misinstallation is also a, a key problem. It turns out that many of our insulation installers are low paid. They end up working for a very short period of time in the trade until they find something better and move on. As a result, trained insulators are few and far between. Once a new insulator gets trained, he's just as likely to go on to some other trade or into some other job. So we have examples of compression all the time where just simply by fitting the, the insulation bat into place, it, it's, it's pushed in a little too far, a, a gap is left open, and, and these are basic quality issues that I'll be looking for in a new home. Another popular way of installing insulation in the wall is to use expanding foam. As the name implies, it can be sprayed into place. It expands to completely fill up the cavity. The foam creates an air barrier of its own so that it doesn't necessarily have to touch the back of the drywall because that surface of that closed cell foam is an air barrier. Now that we're done talking about just the air barriers themselves, we'll start talking about big cavities that air can flow through. Here's an example of a floor joist uh, above a first floor that runs right out over the porch of the house. So there may be a floor, a heated space above that porch, and those joists would seem to just be continuous. But uh, when you do that, air can just blow right up into that floor system and blow right across the wall, above the wall, and into the house. So we, we use blocking in between the joists to keep air from moving from the outside to the inside. And we want to make sure, especially with engineered lumber, that those blocks are cut to fit well. In this illustration, we see that there are still gaps around the edge that sunlight is shining through. And the air can just blow right through that and wash right past the insulation. As we can see, traditional lumber is uh, much easier to block out than engineered lumber because it's not as uh, complicated in its shape. And uh, also we can see that if ventilation is not handled correctly in transitions from one kind of construction to another, that wind can just blow right in and blow the insulation completely out of place. Here we see a soffit vent that has not had any kind of obstruction to the wind installed, and so the wind has completely wind washed all that insulation away. If you look closely at the illustration, you'll see that the plastic vapor barrier on the uh, ceiling below has water condensed up against it, and that's because when that moist air gets up through that, through that assembly, then it touches that cold surface there, crosses the dew point, and turns to liquid. This can lead to all kinds of structural damage or mold. And a small area of insulation blown away can result in more heat loss than the entire attic being less insulated by several inches. To prevent this eventuality from happening, we install cardboard dams or baffles this uh, particular product bends down the bottom to prevent the, the insulation from blowing out or, or falling out into the soffit of the roof system, but allows space above the baffle for air to move in from that ventilated soffit and ventilate the attic completely. There are other means of ventilating attics. A lot of the insulation chutes that we see are made out of styrofoam. They don't fit as perfectly as the cardboard does. They don't incorporate a dam at the end to prevent the insulation from spilling into the soffits. So other measures would have to be taken to prevent that from happening. Slab insulation is critical. In fact, all concrete assemblies are effectively conductors of heat. It doesn't matter whether a concrete wall is four inches thick or six inches or eight inches or 10 inches. We say that the 
insulation value of that concrete wall is R1. In fact, most of the windows in your home are likely to have an insulation value of R2 or even R3 or more, but concrete has an insulation value of R1. If you have uninsulated concrete on your home, then, then you can go through and you can add up all the square feet of exposure that you have there, compare that to the square feet of exposure you have in windows, and you can see that uninsulated concrete can lead to more heat loss than single pane windows. What we do want to do when we assemble a concrete floor or concrete wall is to, to place a foam insulation or some kind of insulation material, usually on the outside to prevent that heat from escaping completely. If you have a slab floor that has a thickened slab that allows for that incorporated footing, you may have to put insulation on the outside. The preferential measure would be to install insulation within the building, which creates a complete thermal break there between the slab and the footing, and also between the slab and the ground that prevents heat from moving through that slab, through the ground, and out. Also, when we use this assembly here with the insulation just merely on the outside, heat can move through that slab and then up through this solid material here. Wood has very little insulation value and then escape out through here. So we're looking for that thermal break. The band joists around the edge of any flooring system, if you don't have a slab floor, are a crucial area for energy loss because that, that, that's a, a region of the building where there are lots of joints. You've got a wall system, which is usually very continuous, very well sealed. It comes down and then it connects to the floor system in a very long seam. Then you've got the floor system that sits on top of the foundation. That connects with a very long seam and there's a lot of opportunity for air to blow in uh, through those large cracks. In fact, most of the air that leaks into or out of a building through the wall system is moving through that sole plate underneath the wall and on top of the floor. Um, that, that band joist there represents a fairly large square footage area of the building. Just measure all sides of the building, multiplied by the height of that band joist, and you've got your total exposed square footage of of band joist, which may be completely uninsulated in most homes in Champaign County, or may be insulated with fiberglass. If that fiberglass is not enclosed on all six sides with an air barrier, then it's probably ineffective. And I know that they're ineffective when I reach up into a band joist and pull out a piece of fiberglass and see that it's completely covered with dirt. That tells me that air has been moving through that fiberglass and filtering dirt out for many years. We can fix this by simply spraying expanding foam into that band joist area, which can then expand over all those joints, most of them, and seal out air leakage while providing fully enclosed air barrier inclusive insulation at the same time. Or we can build a new home with a structurally insulated uh, panel. As I said before, wood does not have very much insulating value. So a two by four stud that's three and a half inches thick is going to have an R value of about 2.5 compared to an R13 value of the insulation in the space between the studs. So it's easy to see that heat can escape out through those solid materials. And sometimes you'll go into a house that has moisture issues and you can see ghosting on the walls where dirt has stuck to that small minute amount of moisture that will settle out on that cold stud when that stud crosses the dew point and then of course the stud gets wet whatever particulate is in the air sticks to those studs and then you'll get a dirty line right up and down the stud so that to us is an indicator. We don't need thermal images when we see that. We know that heat is being lost through those studs. And so in modern construction, 
we like to build with as few structural members as we can get away with doing. So some of the ancient ways of building, to build with double plates, to build with very thick partition uh, connections are uh, going by the wayside. We're finding better ways to attach walls to, uh, to the building and uh, to attach studs or to attach roof trusses to the top of the wall. Here's an example of a ladder being used to tie a partition wall inside of the building to the exterior wall. Normally there would be several two by fours attached into that exterior wall for the interior wall to be nailed to. Instead, we have two by fours that are placed within the wall that we can attach our partition wall inside to. And uh, since those two by fours don't run all the way to the exterior, there's, there's insulation uh, behind those. And so they're partially insulated. Also to prevent uh, heat from escaping through solid materials like studs and going completely to the outside, we have found it uh, beneficial to put continuous insulation on the outside of the whole building. That way, if, uh, if, if heat does escape through the studs, it'll stop right there at that, that outside sheathing. In fact, a, a two by six wall that's five and a half inches thick, full of fiberglass insulation, will lose the same amount of heat as a two by four wall full of fiberglass insulation that has a half inch of foam insulation on the outside. One of the more advanced ways of building is to use structurally insulated panels. The structurally insulated panel is simply a sandwich of insulation foam with plywood on the outside and plywood on the inside and virtually no structural materials in between. The foam itself is very rigid in fact, homes that are insulated with foam are more resistant to thunderstorms and tornadoes than homes that are not insulated with foam because uh, the foam itself becomes structural. In this case, whole wall units, whole roof units can uh, be assembled out of foam and, uh, and plywood. One popular way of insulating concrete walls is to simply form them up with fiberglass, or <clears throat> one popular way to insulate concrete walls is to simply form them up with foam instead of using temporary forms that are then broken off and trucked away. Fire, uh, insulated concrete forms are stacked up like Legos, braced up and reinforced to one another. We pour concrete usually in four foot lifts. After that first four foot sets up a little bit, we come around and we pour that second four foot lift until we've got usually the whole foundation of the house built and in many cases the entire exterior wall of the house can be made out of uh, insulated concrete forms. Those can be finished with any number of materials. With this particular product a nailing flange or, or an attachment flange has been provided that can be screwed into and uh, Conventional siding can be installed on the outside of that. Maybe, um, maybe a stucco-like siding can be troweled directly onto the styrofoam. So there are a lot of options there. One of the defects that I see most, both in new construction and in existing homes, is, is objects, particularly tubs and showers, that have been installed against an exterior wall with maybe no insulation behind them whatsoever or insulation that does not include an air barrier so that uh, if you were to reach behind that shower, if you were to reach behind that tub, you might be able to feel a fiberglass bat with no kind of plastic sheeting, drywall, um, plywood, or any other kind of material that prevents the flow of air through that material, which results in cold showers, uh, a loss of heat in that room. Obviously, if you've got a cold surface, you've got moist air and a cold surface, that cold surface is going to want to cross the dew point. Moisture will then collect on that, resulting in mold, rot, termites. Here we have an infrared image just showing exactly that. 
we have a cold spot down where that tub connects to the outside wall. An architectural detail of the same thing. When I'm checking a new home for continuity of, of insulation, I want to see that an air barrier has been included. So here we have an example of foam sheathing being used as an air barrier. Thermoply, which is a brand name, but uh, basically consists of cardboard that has a uh, foil exterior and interior that will protect that cardboard from moisture and prevent air from moving through. Very simple to install, takes up very little space. Drywall can be laid right over top of it and you might, might not never know that it's there. A defect that is really common in houses built in the 1970s and 80s is a fireplace that is effectively installed outside of the house. I ran into one of these just the other day. We took the chimney cap off of the chimney chase because it was rusting away, build a new one. And when I looked down inside, there was no insulation on the outside walls of that chimney chase, which basically meant that that fireplace unit, which was made out of sheet metal just like this, chimney unit, this fireplace unit, that was on the outside of the house. And so a fireplace on the outside of the house obviously doesn't make much sense. So we want to see insulation in that chase behind the fireplace. Also, once there's insulation back there, we want to see an air barrier. Here's simply a detail of the same thing. In this case, builders have made the mistake of believing that the thermal boundary of the house should be here. They'll often put insulation in this wall with no air barrier so that that insulation has no value at all. And then they'll leave this wall completely uninsulated so that heat can be lost directly out of the fireplace, whether there's a fire burning or not. And then, of course, air leakage through these kind of chases is endemic. Also, I've seen in my many years of construction, lots of floor systems with no insulation in them at all. Here we have an example of exemplary performance. The, the space behind that, uh, that fireplace has been completely insulated and enclosed. Apparently, that's been done with thermoply in, in one application, which I suppose must be fire rated or drywall in another application. A more and more popular method of dealing with attics is to simply bring that attic down inside of the house. Instead of the attic being an exterior space with the insulation placed between the interior and the attic, we simply put the insulation in the roofing system and bring that attic down inside the house. That makes that attic usable as a room and eliminates a whole lot of uh, thermal bypass and thermal bridging issues that we have with attics. There's a continuing debate about whether we should insulate roofs because there would normally be a, a vapor barrier stopping moisture on the inside and of course the roofing material on the outside is waterproof and any moisture that might get into that roofing system, that, that structural system might have a hard time escaping. So the debate continues. Here's that detail where I said that fiberglass insulation needs to be encapsulated on all six sides and very often is not. When you have a vaulted ceiling or a cathedral ceiling, there's usually a wall that goes directly to the attic uh, right above that eight foot mark. And uh, we can see in thermal images very often that heat is being lost directly through this wall Typically, we call that a knee wall, even if it doesn't have that, that height, that pony wall assembly. But uh, when we see a knee wall like that, 90% of the time, they won't have any kind of air barrier on the attic side of that. My solution very often is to simply wrap that, uh, that attic side with Tyvek house wrap. We can use uh, drywall to enclose it with, thermal ply or we can take that fiberglass out completely and just spray the whole thing full of foam. We have an air barrier, we have superior insulation, and it seals up all the connections between that upper wall and the lower wall here too. And typically in shaft walls like this, 
we might see a lot of leakage. It's even possible that, there, that the studs that run up this wall are continuous and there's no blocking at all between this interior wall and that attic space. Very common. Here's your typical knee wall or pony wall. Homes built in the 1950s are frequently found to have walls of this type. People may have little closets in that knee wall attic uh, and there will be little doors that go right into that knee wall attic closet. Well, if you have a door going into a knee wall attic closet, that's really a door to the outside of the house. It should be treated as an exterior door. It should be insulated. It should be properly weather stripped. And typically those kind of access doors are none of those. So we have several challenges with attic knee wall attics. So we have several challenges with knee wall attics. One is the access to the knee wall attic. Number two is the fact that any insulation that might be in that wall usually contains no air barrier. Three is that the floors of these are often not insulated. And uh, additionally, we'll see that, that a person can go up into that attic and really put his arm right down into the floor system here. And in many, many homes built in the 1950s, I've seen assemblies where I can pull the insulation aside and look into that joist space and see the other side of the house so that the wind can literally blow into the attic, blow under the floor, run right through the floor system between the upstairs and the downstairs, chill the whole house, and then blow out the other side. So when we have those kind of breaches, we need to fill them completely with probably what's most affordable, rigid foam, wood, any other kind of material that we can get in there, and then spray over top of it with uh, urethane foam. Here's an example of exemplary performance where some complex attic knee walls have been properly air sealed. Um, it's easy for builders to miss some of these really complex assemblies where they look at something and it, to their mind it doesn't seem like an exterior wall, but is. Here's an example of that exact thing. The builder missed an exterior wall and now it's been fixed. Whenever you have a skylight, the shaft of that skylight is an exterior wall assembly and needs to be insulated, excuse me, whenever you have an attic, <coughs> whenever you have a skylight, the shaft walls of that skylight are exterior walls and they need to be insulated as exterior walls and they need to have an effective air barrier just like any other exterior wall. So when we go into an attic, 90% of the time when I see a skylight assembly, it'll be full of fiberglass insulation, no air barrier. Very often we'll take that fiberglass down, throw it on the attic floor, and spray foam up, uh, up the walls of that, that shaft. Light tubes are becoming much more popular these days. Remember that a light tube is a skylight and that the walls of that light tube are exterior walls. They should be jacketed with some kind of insulation a lot of the new models, a lot of the people who install these today have taken that into account. They're insulating these with foam or an insulation jacket that they can simply put in place afterward. Here we have an example of blocking missing at that porch roof. Again, if, if this goes to the exterior, very often the soffit over, above that porch roof will be ventilated either purposefully or accidentally, air can get right around those soffit materials, get into that porch space, and then move right through the gap between those joists and right on into the house. Since that floor above this living room here is not considered exterior, there will be no insulation in it. Very often a builder will just shove some wads of fiberglass between these joists and hope, that, and hope for the best but uh, as we have discussed before, that doesn't work. We need to block off these locations here 
and that goes for uh, joist cavities between the house and the garage as well. Here we have an example of cold air leakage through those uh, joist bypasses. And we have the uh, exemplary performance of foam insulation that has been put in place and uh, caulked around and completely sealed. Again, a exemplary performance with the sheathing installed on the outside of the exterior wall before the porch is built against it. That will create a complete air barrier on the outside of the house. In homes that were built before 1980, really especially homes built before 1970, it's very typical to see exterior eyebrow roofing, porch roofs, uh, breezeways, and, and other attachments on the outside of the house. Very often, any place that a roof attaches to a heated wall in a house may have no sheathing whatsoever. And if you could reach your arm up into that porch, you would be able to reach right over into the house. Just wide open. Stairwells can also connect to unconditioned space, especially if they're up against a garage, or if they're up against uh, an attic wall, if they're up against uh, an exterior wall, or if they penetrate from, from the upstairs on up into the attic, those, uh, those stairway walls can become a shaft for, for air to, to pass through completely. There have been lots of assemblies that I've found where walking up into the second floor, there's a ceiling above the stairwell. And uh, that ceiling, that, that space above that ceiling just attaches completely to the attic. And when I go up into the attic, I can see that there's almost a room that I can climb down into above that stairwell. These are usually poorly insulated and I can usually reach down right into the studs with my arm and reach down into the building. And air will flow right down between those studs and into the building. So we need to be able to provide architectural details to our carpenters, our insulators, all the other trades working on these assemblies to make sure that they know what to do. One way that uh, certain building systems have gotten around these kind of thermal bypasses is by bringing all of the utilities of the house, the electricity, the plumbing, uh, the ductwork, everything else into the home so that the exterior wall has nothing running through it. There's no ability for air to get through the electric boxes in the outside wall and then blow to the exterior because the electric boxes aren't in the outside wall. There's a double wall assembly. The outside wall is completely isolated the insulation is encapsulated on all six sides <clears throat> and then often a, a small space is provided between the two walls and then the interior wall which is usually also insulated will contain all of the wiring, the electric boxes, telephone, ductwork, plumbing, anything else that needs to be in the exterior of the house. So by creating this double wall system it's possible to keep air from flowing into and out of the house and also it provides a thicker assembly and more insulation. Uh, another way of doing that is to simply build one stud wall on the outside and sheathe it, build another stud wall that's not connected, uh, an airspace in between the two of them, drywall that on the inside and then completely fill that cavity in between with insulation. To me the best way to do that is to blow insulation in. The advantage of doing things this way is that at no time is there a wooden stud that goes all the way from that interior surface to the exterior surface to conduct heat out. In fact, the two walls will usually be staggered with each other so that we don't have one stud lining up with another so we get the maximum insulation value. Here's an example of a double wall some of the studs align, some of them don't. And uh, to go to the floor systems, 
There's a common misconception, I think, that heat is going to rise and that that's always true. Heat wants to go from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. If that opportunity exists, it doesn't matter if the heat goes down. Heat will go down to, uh, to go from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. So insulating exposed floors as they exist above garages or in a, in a cantilevered floor system where the upstairs of the house is hanging out over midair, those kind of floor systems are very, very important. Again, whenever you insulate a cavity, it needs to be filled cover to cover with insulation. So if there's a, an air gap right above that floor before you get to the insulation, then the insulation is doing very, very little work. And you'll have cold floors, you'll have energy problems, there will be convective loops inside of that floor system. Bad flooring systems are extremely common. We want uh, those, those cavities to be completely filled with insulation, cover to cover, and to be enclosed on all six sides. Again, if uh, we have insulation that touches the floor, then we've gone halfway there. But we, we need that insulation to be filled cover to cover from air barrier to air barrier. Now, if we use foam insulation, then, uh, then we, can, we can expect uh, that that foam insulation will form its own air barrier and we don't have to fill the entire space. Again, uh, floors above garages, floors above midair need to be completely isolated from the rest of the house. Otherwise, once cold air gets into that floor system, it can move directly into the house. Warm air from the house can penetrate into that floor system and wash that insulation, that insulating air, those bubbles of air, out of the insulation. So we do need to enclose our floors completely, regardless of what material they're made out of. Web truss floors have more trouble because they, they naturally have openings. Again, another example of a, a floor that connects to the outside. An example of insulation in a flooring system that was not properly installed. Uh, if you have a, a wall cavity or if you have a floor cavity that is 10 inches wide, you can't take a 16 inch bat of insulation and just jam it in there and expect it to work. It needs to be cut to fit and installed properly. So we see assemblies like this all the time, especially when framing carpenters are given the task of installing narrow joist cavities or narrow wall cavities ahead of that being enclosed with plywood or some other kind of material. Again, when we build, we have a process called critical path where one trade gets done with something then the next trade has to come in maybe the first trade comes back and completes something in order to simplify this critical path sometimes carpenters are asked to install insulation they don't always do it well that's why we need inspectors to make sure that the assemblies are done right here we have thermal imaging proof that uh, there's no blocking between the, uh, the interior and the exterior and that maybe there's no insulation in this cantilevered floor here. Um, we can see that cold zone. We can also see the heat from the duct system. Architectural detail of the same. Again, these architectural details need to be written out clearly so that all trades can understand them. Everybody needs to be able to get the memo too. Again, uh, insulation underneath this exposed floor. Um, again, we often see insulation uh, exposed completely underneath the exposed floors, not enclosed properly. And one of the most common thermal bypasses that I see in homes, no matter how old they are, even newer homes, is that a duct or a chimney flue or a pipe or some wiring runs up through a shaft that has been provided in the house for simplicity's sake. Maybe all the utilities in that house 
are put into this shaft just so that uh, there's one big closet everybody can put everything into. And that closet will often be completely open to the attic. And again, very often we can see that closet is completely open to the basement. And I've had plenty of assemblies where I can shine a flashlight up through the shaft and I've got a guy in the attic who can see that light. And whenever you can see light from the basement, you know that you've got a, a positive connection to the exterior. Insulation, fiberglass insulation is not an effective air barrier. It's a psychological barrier. When people see that fiberglass insulation packed around a duct, packed around a wire or a pipe, when they see it shoved into a banjoist, they often say, well, nothing needs to be done here. The work is done and, uh, and we don't need to remove that. It's insulated, it's an air barrier, it's doing its job. In reality, fiberglass insulation like this hurts us because it takes our attention away from the, the proper installation of air barriers. Again, fiberglass does not stop the flow of air. Mineral wool insulation is not an effective way of stopping air either. Penetrations should be closed with uh, solid materials if they're in contact with uh, Penetration should be enclosed with a solid material whenever possible. If we've got a combustion flue from a water heater or from a furnace, then that solid material probably should be sheet metal or drywall or something else that's non-combustible. And then non-combustible caulk like muffler caulk or intumescent caulk that's designed to be fire resistant should be used. Otherwise, ducts should be enclosed with a rigid material as available and then sealed with foam or caulk. When a pipe has to be installed through the top of a wall or a wire or any other kind of utility, we would like to see the plumbers and uh, the sheet metal workers and everyone else who's working to drill the appropriate sized hole instead of drilling a hole that's much, much larger than it needs to be. I know that that means taking time to change bits when a plumber wants to just be able to put one bit into his whole hog and go and fire out every hole in the house. That's uh, a time saver for him, but it creates problems in the long run for the home. So uh, some of these penetrations can leave very large holes, particularly underneath a tub. Uh, air can communicate underneath that tub, again leading to condensation, mold, termites, rot, uh, often these kinds of tub penetrations are filled with uh, mineral wool, which is not an effective way of preventing airflow. Pipe penetrations should be caulked around or should be sealed with foam. Uh, depending on its location, that uh, material may need to be fire resistant. And uh, again, a flu shaft needs to be treated with fire resistant materials. Also again, fire rated caulk around the flu shaft. In this case we have an intumescent caulk which expands when uh, it comes in contact with heat. Also muffler caulk is often used. Muffler caulk is usually black in color. It's very resistant to heat not necessarily compliant with codes in all locations. Another really common thermal bypass that I see in new homes and in existing homes is that attic access inside of the house. If we can locate an attic access in the garage or in some other location outside the heated space, then that is a huge improvement already because whenever you've got a hole, obviously, from the heated space into the unheated space, we're inviting there to be some kind of risk of air infiltration, poor joints in the insulation and, and in the construction. So especially the examples where we drywall a ceiling, then we go with a saw and cut out that piece of drywall and uh, simply use some door trim to uh, create a shelf to put that drywall back onto. Those are poorly sealed because there's usually no gasket to prevent air from flowing right around that drywall. 
they often have no insulation on top of them at all. If insulation is installed, it's usually draped over the top instead of attached to that drywall with uh, full alignment as it should be. And, uh, and also, when, when we install a, an access into a ceiling like that, very often, unless there's a dam built up around that access to hold the insulation back, we'll find that the insulators will, uh, will taper off their use of insulation as they get closer and closer to that hatch. I've done it myself over the years. Uh, we don't want that insulation falling through whenever somebody gets up into the attic for some purpose, and so they taper off the use of insulation close to the hatch that greatly reduces the thermal performance of that part of the attic. And uh, if I could do the mathematics for you right now, I can show you how a two foot by two foot section of uh, attic that's completely uninsulated can turn an R38 attic into an R15 attic by simply moving more heat through that small space than would otherwise be lost through the entire attic floor. So when we, when we do a, an attic access, we want to make sure that it's sealed properly. We want to make sure that it's insulated properly and that the insulation that, that uh, abuts that access is uh, robust enough. Here we have an example of insulation that has been glued to the top of the hatch. I use uh, an expanding foam. I just spray it right onto the back of the drywall and attach a piece of uh, fiberglass that has been cut to fit. Uh, I use an R38 section of, of fiberglass because it's already to the desired thickness. It stays put when you, when you go up into the attic. It stays attached to the hatch. When you put it back, it stays attached to the hatch. Gaskets can be of the foam rubber kind, but I find that those aren't as durable. We'd like to see the gasket that has the metal strip in it that can be screwed down. I hope that you found that the materials in this program are useful in helping you understand basic defects in construction. And I, I hope that you can find the Thermal Bypass Checklist Guide, which is what we were just discussing, and, uh, and that you can work hard to make better buildings.